Okay. Well, we are going to get started. Thank you all for being here. My name is Helen Schroeder. I'm sure you've seen it pop up in some of your emails over the last few weeks. I'm the marketing coordinator at Sigma Assessment Systems, and I will be co-facilitating your webinar today with my colleague, Dr. Ariana Thompson. For those of you who are new to Sigma, we are a professional services firm, and we offer talent development, succession planning, and psychological assessments for organizations that are looking to build their internal talent pools. Sigma has been in business for over 50 years, so as a company, we've had a lot of experience, and today we are here to talk to you about integrity. So we have about 60 minutes together. For the first 45 minutes or so, Ariana will walk you through the webinar content. This webinar is being recorded and we will share the slides, so no need to take frantic notes. Uh, and as we go, feel free to post any questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your webinar screen there. Uh, we'll save the last 15 minutes or so to go through the questions together and then you can ask more questions as they come up there as well. If there's anything that we don't get to in our hour today, we can also follow up via email, but don't be shy, use that Q&A box, that's what it's there for. And now, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Ariana and get her to kick off our webinar. So Dr. Ariana Thompson is a senior leadership consultant at Sigma, and she's a specialist in leadership and culture. She believes in positively transforming the modern day workplace through thought-provoking, evidence-based insights. Ariana is a subject matter expert in executive leadership, success and management, wellness cultures, and employee growth. In her work at Sigma, she supports the executive team with succession planning, leadership development, and talent assessments. So Ariana, thank you very much for being here. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Helen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Great Leaders Have Integrity. In addition to my years of leadership consulting experience, I'm also going to be drawing on my experience as an ethics and compliance advisor, where I was working in the space of ethical culture assessment with a company called LRN, who is a leading ethics and compliance training provider. So we're going to have some interesting conversations about integrity and ethical culture today. To give you a sense of where we're going in our session today, here's a brief agenda. We're going to look at what is integrity and why is it important? And what are some common barriers to maintaining integrity? Then we're going to look at the different levels of integrity. And there's personal integrity, interpersonal integrity, and then at the most macro level, organizational integrity. Then we'll wrap up with some key takeaways and suggest some tools and resources if you're interested in further development. All right, let's jump in. What is integrity? Integrity is demonstrating a high quality of character. So this includes being honest, ethical, trustworthy, sincere. And in an organizational context, it also means effectively representing and respecting company values. What we know from the literature is that integrity is actually an enduring character trait rather than something that's a one-off or an occasional action. So it's not circumstantial or situational, it's about what we do day in and day out. The word integrity evolved from the Latin integer meaning whole or complete. So in other words, meaning looking at the wholeness or soundness of one's character. And integrity requires both morality and consistency. So morality is our inherent sense and belief around what is right and wrong. This may involve emotional reactions that trigger us to understand, yes, this is an action I support, or this is an action that goes against my, my personal morals. So then when we pair it with that consistency piece, it's about how often we're staying true to our own sense of morality. So times where that is less consistent, where we're not actually being able to live out our personal beliefs around what is right and what is wrong, this Venn diagram might look more like this. But when we are consistently applying our code of ethics and our personal morals, that Venn diagram is going to be almost overlapping completely. So we'd like to take a quick poll here. We'll be trying to get your engagement throughout the session. We'd love to hear from you. So Helen's gonna bring up our first poll of the day. First, we wanna know, is integrity spoken about at your organization? Is this a word you hear in your culture? And then the second question is, what is what role does integrity play in your organization? So I'll give everyone a few um, 
maybe a minute or so to answer this question. All right, a few more seconds to try and get your answers in. All right, so let's see. It looks like, yes, 90% of our audience is saying that integrity is spoken about at your organization. That's wonderful. Maybe in the Q&A later, you can let us know how it's spoken about or feel free to share a comment. And then let's see, what role does integrity play? 100% of people said that integrity plays a part in the values, that we assess integrity in employees, that it impacts hiring and promotion decisions. And it's only, it gets smaller saying that integrity is developed as a leadership skill. So this shows me that there's a little bit more of a need to apply the values in times to hiring and promoting as well as development in organizations. Thank you for answering that poll today. So why is integrity important? Why is it something that should be talked about, prioritized, and developed? Well, especially if you're a leader, integrity impacts your reputation and therefore it impacts the reputation of your team as well. Furthermore, people who have integrity are confident, reliable, and calm. And perhaps surprisingly, we also know that people who score higher on integrity also score higher on job performance. So I personally find that quite interesting. Additionally, when there is a presence of integrity and through leaders, this is felt at the team level. So it cultivates increased team trust, a higher level of job satisfaction, enhances productivity, and even increases retention. But why might people not engage in integrity? It seems like something that we all appreciate and has many benefits, but there may be personal or practical barriers that are experienced when trying to live out integrity. So the first personal barriers is having inconsistency across context. So that can happen if we feel like there's an expectation that we show up differently one place or another, if we feel like we need to modify our behavior to please certain groups around us. But the more we can have consistency in our approach and our actions, the more we can build that trust and integrity with others. There can also be instances where we actively compromise on our morals and beliefs, sometimes being shown as being hypocritical. You know, those people who say, uh, do as I say, not as I do. So integrity is really important that what we say in our follow through, that those are aligned. But as we know, that can sometimes be harder to practice than we think. The next one is not knowing your own morals, values, or beliefs. It takes a certain level of self-awareness and investigation to know what you truly believe, what your own viewpoints are around what is right and what is wrong, and establishing that is really important in order to maintain that consistency. And then another one is fear of authenticity. Authenticity can feel vulnerable for people. It can feel like something that's a little bit further than what they want to express. But being true to who you are comes out through to integrity. Next, there are also practical barriers. So just making too many commitments um, or that it could be too time sensitive and you can't have that follow through. That's similar to the next one of not keeping track of commitments. So if you say you're going to do one thing, but then there's no follow through, that could lead to a decreased perception of personal integrity. Also related to that, inconsistent or ineffective communication. So if people are perceiving that you're saying one thing, but that's not actually what you're trying to communicate, that could also create a gap. And then lastly, especially when we're talking about organizational integrity, not knowing the group norms, morals, or beliefs that could lead to accidentally violating the social code that is present and people could perceive your integrity to be lower than it might be in reality. 
So I'm really curious to hear from you. Which of these personal or practical barriers have you been impacted by? Are there any of these that you've struggled with in the past or had to overcome? Thanks for your engagement. We'll give everyone about 30 more seconds. All right, let's see how everyone answered. So we have uh, a few selected across the board. This is interesting. On the whole, not one really rose to the top. So fear of being authentic, changing one's behavior across context, not knowing one's own morals, values, or beliefs, not keeping track of a commitment, making too many commitments, inconsistent or ineffective communication, and not knowing a group's morals or beliefs. So that's great. It's actually, I think it's wonderful to see that we all have different ways that we might struggle with this concept of integrity and supporting each other in expressing authenticity, helping set boundaries around commitments. These are different things that we'll talk about in this session. Um, so I hope that it is helpful to you. And here's a quote by Dwight Eisenhower that I really like. The supreme quality of leadership is unquestionable integrity. Without it, no real success is possible. So next, let's jump into talking about the levels of integrity. There's personal integrity, interpersonal integrity, and organizational integrity. And we're going to start with the first one. Are you true to yourself? So personal integrity involves aligning one's actions, values, and beliefs, consistently demonstrating honesty and ethical behavior. In other words, being true to your word and to yourself. To build personal integrity, this takes time and dedication. It requires you to take time to reflect and understand yourself, cultivating that deep self-awareness. You also need to identify and know your values and then stand by them in everyday interactions. It requires the ability to feel and express your emotions, ideally in a healthy manner. Again, this next one requires a balance of being transparent but self-controlled or sharing your thoughts kindly but also candidly. So many of these things are easy to say and sound relatively simple, but in reality, they can be quite difficult to put into practice especially in the workplace. So first off, understanding yourself and your emotions requires emotional intelligence, otherwise known as EI or sometimes EQ. And they have found that self-awareness is really at the root of EQ. And studies show that your abilities to connect with your feelings impacts many things, including how you connect with others' feelings, how you're able to respond in stressful situations, and also it impacts how others respond to you. So here's a few recommendations to help you better understand your own emotions. First, listen to your body and identify patterns. So emotional changes are linked to bodily reactions. So some of the ones mentioned here are heart rate, fidgeting, muscle tension. So if you ever notice, tune in with yourself to notice what your body is doing. It, are you feeling some sweaty palms? You might be feeling tension in your chest area. If you're having a hard time speaking up and speaking out against something, you might feel tightness in your throat. So these are some cues that you can tune into to understand, well, how am I feeling about this? Where am I feeling it in my body? And how can that inform me of what I'm truly feeling and what action I need to take next? The next one is to practice talking about your emotions. I think that this is changing in our society, but many people grew up understanding or believing that emotions are not that useful and ideally not to be expressed. There's also different ways that this comes out in a gendered way where men have been taught that masculinity means not displaying sadness and women are often taught that they're not allowed to be angry. 
So practicing talking about what it is that you truly feel, talk about it with others who you trust. This can help you to better understand your own emotions, what you're really feeling, and increase your ability to engage in emotion identification. So interestingly, there was a study that found that on average, most people could only name three emotions. So if, if this is something you've ever struggled with, I recommend you looking at what is called an emotions wheel. And you can look, am I disappointed, sad, angry? And there's all these spectrum of emotions that you may be feeling at any given time. And then lastly, leveraging coping skills for emotional regulation. So if you do find yourself in a heightened state, this is a good time to take a pause, take a break, and tune into something like deep breathing or meditation. So for this reason, I'd like to practice a few minutes of meditation with you here today. I hope that this will help support you in feeling calm and also knowing that there are simple tools that you can have in your toolbox for practicing emotional regulation. So if you'd like to join me, I'd like you to, if you'd like to just close your eyes, I'm going to keep my eyes open for this activity, but you can just slowly settle your eyes down. And now I want you to take the three biggest deep breaths that you've taken all day. So I'm going to stay on camera and not mute in, just do this along with you, but please join me if you're able. And just check in with yourself and notice, is your breathing coming easily? Is it a little bit forced? Is it shallow? Is it deep? And next, I want you to engage in a body scan. So still with your eyes closed, if you'd like, just take a check-in of your body. How are you feeling? And are you feeling like your energy is really occupied, occupying your head space? How are you feeling in your chest area? Spread that out. Notice any tensions in the rest of your body. Notice if you're holding, holding any tension or if you're feeling especially relaxed today, just note any observations. And while you're doing this, just take three more breaths. And then lastly, for our exercise today, this is the last tool I want to leave you with. It's kind of an interesting one. So I want you to take your two fingers, probably your thumb and your pointer finger, and I want you to rub them together so, so um, at such a pressure that you can feel the ridges on your fingertips. So I want you to bring your awareness out to your fingers and really notice your fingertip ridges. So especially for really in our head or our chest area, this actually helps to move our attention and our energy out in our body and to notice these different sensations. And this is actually a very simple, simple but powerful mindfulness technique. Similarly, you can bring your energy all the way down to your feet and notice your toes and wiggle your toes a little. This helps send your energy out to all parts of your body, and this hopefully helps you in finding increased calm and regulation. All right, we're going to end this meditation on just one more deep breath. Thank you for joining me in this mindfulness exercise. I hope that you can try this again if you're ever experiencing emotional um, if you're triggered or experiencing emotional heightened experiences, this is a great way to practice a little bit of coming back to yourself in the present. All right, so some other strategies to build your personal integrity are to set your standards. So to have really clear standards for yourself and your own behavior and habits, make sure that you're applying them consistently across all aspects of your life. Additionally, maintain values-based decision-making. So you want to make sure that your values are the guiding, the guiding tools that you use for any decision-making. So if you've never done a values exercise before, there are some free online resources that allow you to sort your values and understand what your top values are. So this might be 
personal health. It could be connecting with family. It could be doing your best and leveraging your work to find personal passion and meaningfulness. But we all have unique values, but leaning on our values helps us to make decisions that are in an alignment with our own best interests and hopefully the best interests of those around us as well. And then lastly, uphold accountability. So making sure you're taking responsibility for your actions, your habits, your outcomes, and really truly empowering yourself. It can be tempting in the space of personal integrity to sometimes fall into a victim mode. I myself have experienced this where life is challenging and I feel a bit of a victim to the current circumstances, but it's important to remind yourself that you are empowered to take action that helps bring you into right, into right alignment and helps you to make the best decisions that are going to uphold your personal integrity. So number two, that was all about personal integrity, integrity at your own level. Now we're going to talk about interpersonal integrity. So are you true to others? Do you act with integrity in your relationships? So interpersonal integrity refers to the consistency and authenticity in the interactions with others, especially based on trust, respect, and ethical conduct. This plays a vital role in establishing strong connections, effective communication, and collaboration. Foundational principles for interpersonal integrity are respect, that hopefully is a no-brainer, but treating everyone with dignity, valuing perspectives that are different from your own and allowing other people to hold their own beliefs and ideologies, and showing empathy and understanding. Also key for interpersonal integrity is honesty and transparency. So really pushing yourself to be open and truthful across contexts, sharing information and avoiding deception or any hidden agendas. Even if it's a hidden agenda for your own team, that, that still could get in the way of interpersonal integrity. Again, authenticity, I mentioned this one earlier, but being true to yourself and genuine in interactions and trustworthiness, which we'll talk about in greater depth in just a little bit. Some strategies for cultivating increased interpersonal integrity are being dependable. So again, this relates to this theme that we're gonna see throughout this entire presentation around having consistency. So doing what you say you're going to do and avoiding any mixed messages, continually working on having clear communication, Practicing active listening, so really putting aside your beliefs when necessary to understand others. You don't always have to agree, but taking that time to listen is a critical skill that surprisingly is missed um, quite a bit of the time. People can be rushed. They can feel like they have a lot on their to-do list, but if you can't take the time to actively listen, that could impact your interpersonal integrity. And lastly, conflict resolution. So making sure you're you're taking charge of your own relationships and not avoiding taking on the conflict head on. So you want to make sure that you're practicing having the courage of addressing conflicts that emerge, seeking win-win solutions, and maintaining respect and collaboration throughout the way. Like I mentioned earlier, trust is also in very, very integral to cultivating interpersonal integrity. Because when trust is present, people will feel psychologically safe, respected and valued both on your team and on other teams across the organization. And then this in turn will encourage other people to open up to you with honest communication and respect as well. Trust is also essential for vulnerability, mutual understanding and cooperation, creating a more positive work environment. So how do we establish trust? You establish trust by demonstrating your character and your competence. So I want to show you this model of trust that was developed um, by Frances Frey. And I believe she actually does research at Harvard and it's called Begin With Trust. So as I were studying, how do you establish trust? These are the three facets that emerged. So the first one is logic. This is probably what we most often think of. It's having sound reasoning and logic that helps people get cognitively on board with what you're trying to communicate. 
The next one is authenticity. Isn't it interesting that authenticity is critical for trust, but people want to feel like they're really experiencing who you surely are and not a pretense or a deceptive version. And that really helps them to feel trustworthy with you and going forward, especially if you're trying to get them on board with something. And lastly, this other piece is also critical, which is empathy. So making sure that as you're communicating with them, they feel like you understand where they are in their shoes and that you care about their, their needs and their success as well. So these are the three research-based ways that you can begin to cultivate trust. To maintain, to, excuse me, to maintain trust, you must honor your commitment. So this one's a little more straightforward. It goes back to that concept of consistency, but making sure you honor what you say you're going to do and having that follow through. And then lastly, if you need to repair trust, this just means taking ownership for mistakes and responsibility for reparations. So apologizing when needed, and I think this is an important reminder for all of those in the workplace. There can feel like this pressure at times to be perfect at work. But the reality is, is that we are all humans and we're bound to make mistakes. So the key here is just taking ownership and showing that you're willing to be accountable for your own mistakes. And this will help people to feel that there is that integrity, even if something goes awry. So again, I want to hear from you, which of these trust mechanisms do you find most difficult to use? Establishing trust, maintaining trust, or repairing trust? All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds. Please get your answers in. All right, so we had about 31% say establishing trust is the most difficult. I understand that sometimes it's hard to get the trust that you need from someone, especially if someone else is operating from a lower trust zone themselves. Establishing trust can be a challenge. I'm impressed that this group said 0% in maintaining trust, uh, that this is a high performing group of in, in our audience today. And I can see that you're likely following through on all your commitments. And then almost 70% said that repairing trust is hard. I, I also think that makes sense. I don't know if you've ever had that sinking feeling in your in your stomach when you've made a mistake and you know you have to take accountability for it, but that is a hard thing to do sometimes. So thank you so much for your candid responses. All right, now we're going to move on to our last level of integrity, which is organizational integrity. Are you true to your family, company, school, team, or other groups or affiliations? Organizational integrity refers to the consistent adherence to ethical principles, values, and behaviors that are established by your organization. I know I mentioned many other types of organizations, but for this, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the workplace context. Organizational integrity establishes the foundation for an ethical culture, promoting trust among employees, and influencing decision-making processes. Contributors to organizational integrity include clear organizational policies and standards. As I mentioned, I'm also coming from my perspective of an ex-ethics and compliance person, and it was shocking to see how few organizations have codes of conduct and policies sometimes. Obviously, there are many organizations that are doing this well. But if you are in the, in the group that is not establishing your organizational policies, this is a really important place to start. Also having ethical leadership. So what do you do if your leaders are not demonstrating integrity? This can be really destructive for the work environment. Therefore, leaders must model ethical behavior, demonstrate integrity, and promote ethical conduct. 
we know that people actually learn the most by observational learning. So this is why it's so important that leaders actually model the behavior that they want employees to follow through with. Further, ethical decision-making, you see this in every level. We need to have personal ethical decision-making, interpersonal ethical decision-making, but this is also highly important at the organizational level. So making sure that the organization is considering the impact on stakeholders and also leveraging organizational values for decision-making as well. And lastly, upholding transparency and accountability. Many organizations do not share information that widely with employees, sharing information only on a need to know basis, but we're seeing an evolution in work styles and organizational work styles. We're going more employees want wide transparency on what their organization is doing and why, and providing that as a leader and an organizational leader is critical to organizational integrity. But if you do foster organizational integrity, there are going to be many, many benefits. So first, this boosts employee engagement and stakeholder trust, including employee trust. So people are more engaged with what you're doing, especially if they have a clear understanding of what you're doing and why, and they feel like you are making ethical decisions. It can boost a positive, it can create a positive company reputation and therefore positive business outcomes. So if you know of any companies that are upholding high integrity, one of the best known ones is Patagonia, where this organization is rather beloved due to their high level of integrity. That is what has built their company reputation and maintaining it over time as well. They have a high level of care about sustainability and have even donated their money towards national parks and other things like that. And that really builds a good reputation across most stakeholders and customers as well. You're also gonna reduce your ethical risks. So I've seen many instances where companies are having to deal with the, the fallout of pretty high intensity misconduct. So whether or not it's an oil spill in the ocean or a uh, corruption that is exposed, this can be re this can really tarnish your organizational reputation, and people may not want to work with you if they discover that there is misconduct happening. And that can also pose severe legal risks as well that can be quite costly for the organization. And then lastly, attracting top talent. So people who know your organizational reputation of integrity are going to want to work with you. And these days, different platforms like Glassdoor are making it increasingly, it's increasingly, candidates are increasingly able to check out what is the inner culture of this organization. It used to be that you had no idea, but now you can go and read reviews from people who have worked there and are either recommending the organization or recommending you stay away from the organization. So again, if you want to take the next step to cultivate strong organizational integrity, as I mentioned, establish your code of conduct and stick to it. And in that code of conduct, there should ideally be lists of your top values. What are your values? Why are they your values? And how do you stand by them? And then the next step is to provide values-based training and education across all levels of employees so that people know what your values are and how they're being embodied. Also support resolution. So if people are having ethical concerns or questions, am I allowed to accept this gift from somebody who is a potential business partner or is that bribery? These are different questions that people might need help answering, especially because there are a lot of gray areas that can occur in an organizational setting. So helping them to answer these questions will support your organization. The next step of that is also helping them when misconduct has already occurred or if there are interpersonal um, relationship misconduct instances happening. So unfortunately, when I was in, uh, in the space of ethical culture assessment and looking at rates of misconduct across the organization, we saw that harassment and discrimination consistently emerged as a top form of misconduct across organizations. So if people are experiencing different interpersonal forms of misconduct, you need to help support them in mediation or potentially further action, depending on the severity of the incident. 
but many organizations don't have ethics and compliance departments. Some organizations don't even have HR. So if you are in, in this category, please consider creating employee feedback channels and allocating resources to supporting organizational integrity. And lastly, but perhaps most importantly, is rewarding ethical behavior. So providing rewards and recognitions creates a positive feedback loop for organizational integrity. So highlight people who are living the values, highlight people who reported misconduct, show that the organization cares about this, prioritizes it, and rewards ethical behavior. So the last thing I wanna leave you with is in this section is actually this model of ethical performance that I think helps to just visually help tie everything together. So this is a paper that I actually worked on in, in a, one of my past roles at LRM. This is an ethical performance model. And what we found through structural equation modeling is that the core architecture for an ethical culture has those elements of corporate ethics, code of conduct, transparency, reward systems in the performance management system. But then leadership at that first step is equally important of modeling those, reinforcing those, showing that we truly stand by the written, the written word of what we say. And collectively, these create a positive work atmosphere characterized by trust, organizational justice, belonging, and freedom of expression. And in turn, this fosters ethical performance where people have values-based conduct, uphold their performance even under pressure. So sometimes when this is when we see integrity go is when there's high pressure situations, but making sure that people still uphold integrity even then. And then lastly, speaking out about misconduct. So you wanna create an environment where people feel psychologically safe to call out misconduct that is happening um, within the environment. So I hope this gives you a sense of how organizational integrity can be cultivated even though it starts with all of us at that personal level as well. So to recap, to improve personal integrity, align your actions with your values, consistently demonstrate honesty and authenticity in interactions and be accountable. To improve interpersonal integrity, demonstrate your character and competence, honor your commitments and take responsibility for mistakes. And to improve organizational integrity, foster a culture of transparency, accountability, ethical behavior, and consistently uphold and reinforce ethical standards and organizational values. So this might be our final poll of this session. Which level of integrity do you or your does your organization need to develop the most? All right, we'll give it about five more seconds. Oh, no, nope, looks like we're closing now. That's perfect. All right. So it seems like most people are doing pretty good on their personal integrity. I like to see it with only 15% saying that's something they need to work on. And then a half and half between interpersonal integrity and organizational integrity. Thanks for answering that question for us. So this is my last quote of the day. Integrity is choosing courage over comfort, choosing what is right over what is fun, fast, or easy, and choosing to practice our values rather than simply professing them. That's by Brene Brown. So as mentioned at the start, we would like to leave you with some tools and resources if you are interested in this topic and want to further develop integrity either with yourself, your team, or your organization. So for some practical ideas on how you can develop integrity, develop, download our Integrity Competency Development Guide. And we'll be sharing these slides after the session so you can click on the hyperlinks. And for a set of mini integrity development challenges, you can, there are some challenges in here that you can do both evening, in both in the morning and the evening or however it works best for you via Sigma's Character Challenge Calendar. So check that out if that sounds interesting. 
And then lastly, for a brief overview of integrity best practices and principles, you can look at our leadership series. Also, if you liked this type of content or are interested in bringing development workshops to your team or organization, you can take a look at Sigma's Lunch and Learn series. And if you're interested on how you or your team is doing on integrity, you may be interested in our Leadership Skills Profile Revise, known as our LSPR. This is both a personality and leadership inventory, which can be quickly administered, and then you can receive a focus report, which gives you a summary of your own leadership competencies and how you rank across them. So here's a, give, to give you a sense of what's in that LSPR assessment, we measure cognitive, interpersonal, personal, and senior leadership skills. So you can see integrity is one of the core skills and personal leadership qualities. So if you wanted to take an assessment to further assess your own leadership competencies, this is a great one that I would recommend. And then if you wanna take it deeper with talent development services, we have a lot of great consulting offerings, both customized and a little bit more process oriented from our best practices. You can download our free high potential talent development guide or take part in individual or group coaching. Or again, we have a great lunch and learn series that we can offer you. So with that, thank you so much for your time and attendance today. We'll now open it up to a Q&A session. Thank you, Ariana. All right, I've got some questions for you here. So the first one is, what are tips and tricks for working with a manager that you think lacks integrity? Yeah, this is the tricky one. I think that first and foremost, I would always start with your personal integrity. So know what it is, know what it is that you feel like they're not doing that upholds integrity. Are they going against some of your own morality beliefs or your values and try to understand why there's a rub in the first place? Next, I would encourage you to have some courage to practice what we call leading upwards or leading up, which is to have a candid conversation. You can always start with I messages, like I feel like we're not living out this value. Do you believe in this value? Do you think that there's something we could do? Um, the next suggestion would be maintaining your personal boundaries. So in any context where a leader is pushing you to do something that you may deem unethical, know that you have it in your personal power to say no and say that's not something I'm willing to do. Perhaps it's not in the scope of my job. And you could say that you're not willing to do it and then see how the conversation unfolds from there. And then lastly, if the incident is very severe and they are violating potentially ethical standards of the organization, I would challenge you to report their behavior especially if it's going to be a, a liability and risk to the organization if the behavior persists. Thank you. Those are great tips. Okay. Um, how do personal, interpersonal, and organizational integrity tie together? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Helen. Well, they're really all different levels. So the personal is the most micro level. So you only have control over your own actions. But it, the, the culmination of, let's say, a team's personal integrity will then often create their interpersonal integrity of a group on that team. And then at that level, all the teams group together to create the organizational integrity. So at the end of the day, it takes every single one of us to maintain and uphold integrity at the personal level. And then this fosters interpersonal integrity and then hopefully cultivate strong organizational integrity. But you'll notice from our presentation that many of the tips are the same. So having, knowing who you are and then practicing that with consistency, doing that even on the team level, openly communicating and then openly communicating even outside of your team so you can break down silos. Many of these principles scale up to create integrity at the personal, interpersonal and organizational levels. Thank you. Um, how can you help someone else develop integrity? Hmm. 
Hmm, that's a great question. Well, I would recommend many of the strategies that we talked about today, but I also recommend you having a coaching conversation with them. So if they're struggling with integrity, you might understand, try to understand why are they coming up on these personal or practical barriers like you mentioned earlier? Is it because they don't know their own values and could use support in understanding their own values? Or are they making too many commitments and need help practicing saying no and not being not falling into people pleasing tendencies like sometimes happens. And then from there, we can leverage our development guide to practice different activities related to integrity and really just using that assessment of what they're struggling with to help inform the development actions that would best support them growing in this space. That's good. Okay, here's an interesting one. Is it possible to have one but not other levels of integrity? Yeah, I when you give the most psychologist answer and say it depends, <laughs> but I think it is possible. For instance, you can have personal integrity, but be on a team that is toxic, quite honestly, where you have the integrity, but you're not seeing that in the people around you. Maybe it's highly competitive and people are willing to kind of skirt around the rules to get to achieve their own personal objectives. Or let's say your team has a high level of integrity, but perhaps the senior leaders at the organization are not demonstrating or modeling that integrity. I once worked with an organization and we did an ethical culture assessment with them with their entire organization. And they scored low on things like trust and leadership and modeling. And we went and presented this, these findings to their senior leadership team. And at the end of the day, they basically said that they didn't care, that the financials of their organization were still panning out. Yes, we're ex experiencing extremely high turnover, but at the end of the day, we're not going to invest any more time or resources into cultivating a more positive culture. So this can happen and it's disappointing when it does, but I encourage you to always maintain your personal integrity, try to lead up and when necessary, even leave a circumstance that isn't right for you. Thank you. Okay. Can you share examples detailing the impact of strong and weak organizational integrity? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm always really proud of organizations that live out their values. A recent example for me is I watched this well-made uh, video that was created by Apple recently. And you can probably Google search it if you're interested, but they, they role play Mother Nature coming on site to Apple to do a sustainability check. And in this video, it really clearly details how they are committing to sustainability, how they're reducing their impact on the globe. And I was personally inspired when I saw that they were actually dedicated to reducing environmental harm and other things like that. So I thought that was a really good example of people living their values. I think for me, it did increase the brand perception of Apple, knowing that if I buy a product from them, it's likely to be a net neutral to the environment. In contrast, lots of things can go wrong if there's not organizational integrity. So I don't think I'm going to name any specific examples for this one. But for instance, for me, if you're not caring about your supply chain. So many organizations that produce clothing, for example, have gotten some heat for sweatshop work or slave labor picking cotton. So I think that caring about your entire ecosphere of your organization is really important to show that you're having integrity each step of the way and that you're accomplishing your business goals through ethical action. Great example. Um, okay, last question here. So if any of you have any floating around in your mind, now's the time, add it to the list. Um, how do you maintain personal integrity if organizational integrity is not strong? Yeah, I think I answered this one a little earlier with one of our first questions, but I think at the end of the day, this comes down to maintaining your own values and boundaries. So know the line that you're willing to go. You know, there may just be some instances where interactions interpersonally are a bit fiery and make you feel a little um, 
a little unsafe psychologically in the space. And so in those certain circumstances, I would recommend that you just, you know, uphold your own needs, practice self-care, rejuvenate outside of work, make sure that you're not staying past your work hours. Um, in other instances, you may need to more directly uphold your boundaries and tell people that you will not do something that you deem to be unethical or to stray away from organizational values or standards. Um, so it's kind of about maintaining your own sense of being true to yourself while still, you know, doing the best work for your organization, but having a low tolerance for unethical behavior. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I will wrap us up. Uh, just to let you know, again, you are welcome to send questions anytime via email to us, and we can engage with that online. Uh, for those of you here who are ATD certified, this webinar does count for professional development credits. So you know who you are, and you'll know what you need to do to cover that. But if you do have any questions, also feel free to shoot us an email. If you liked what you saw here, please come join us for one of our other webinars this year. We have them running monthly. Uh, I just sent the link in the chat for our events page. That's where you can take a look at the calendar. We've got webinars about succession planning, leadership development, all sorts of different things, assessments. Uh, and if there's something on there that you don't see that you would like to see, you're also welcome to submit suggestions to us and we'll take those into account. We absolutely want these to be a space where you get your questions answered. Okay, when you close this webinar, you will see a feedback survey pop up. Um, like I said, we want these webinars to be useful to you. So if you don't mind, please take a minute to fill that out. We do go through every single response and we change how we do webinars accordingly. So we would welcome your feedback and we hope to see you in one of our future sessions. Thank you so much, Ariana, and to everyone for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Have a great day.